farming simulator where you pretend you have a tractor and you kind of go out and yeah uh pretend you're a farmer i could see where that could could be valuable like learning how to do real shit i mean except for actually the hands-on knowing how to do. <laughs> all right but what point do you think then if a lot of these games in which you're building right uh minecraft and things like that are shifting away from people actually going out there to actually build things so you like right. I played with Legos. You played with Legos? Uh, a little bit, not not enough, but yeah. I once made the entire water world, uh, world mm-hmm. <laughs> out of Legos. Uh, do you remember that movie, Kevin Costner? Yep, One that was an underrated movie. I think so too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, best best uh, top ten of my list. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. So I made the whole entire set out of Legos. Um, but I guess outside of that, <laughs> like now you have a lot of people in the thirties, like us. Yeah, uh, and I'm curious about uh i guess the lack of actually want to build things mm-hmm. right or real things in the real world right um or if that's like a hindrance of some sort yeah if you're if you're not presented with the uh, you know entry costs that are reasonable like it's tough to enter into things that you might otherwise want to do i mean right. financing for things that are real i don't know Got to. I guess you have to start small, but like just picturing real estate related stuff, it's that's right. Yeah, really tough to uh, for somebody to even who's like talented and knows engineering and different things like that, just to get the approvals from local government. And that's right. To be able to build what you want, or there's this guy who local government wouldn't let him build a garage, so he built middle a middle finger middle finger monument. Yeah, he <laughs> wanted to build like an eleven thousand square foot garage or something. <laughs> All right, so maybe <laughs> the government uh, engineering of people kind of inhibits these natural instincts or areas of interest to kind of proclivities to kind of engage yourself in. So, like, people mm-hmm. said, what's the, you know, it's not worth going to business sometimes these days with all the regulations you have to pay, the overhead cost of yeah. um, uh, code enforcers coming out there. Or something we're going to talk about later, um, the um, Disability Act. Right. right. Uh, and so, like, you know, you're not going to make much money out there, slim, if any, profits. Uh, so what's the point of trying to make something in your own backyard if sure. the local code enforcer will come out there and say, yeah, no, you didn't ask us permission. Yeah. Uh, you know, we didn't get our cut. You're going to have to destroy the whole thing. Uh, or upgrading the um, house or building that you have, you might not choose to do that because – they will say, okay, but if you're going to upgrade it, then you have to add X, Y, Z, handrails, and all this different stuff, and um, you got to add an ADA-compliant ramp to right. this place. And if you want it, or don't do anything, and, and you're grandfathered in okay, right. what you have. I heard a story about a guy in California who was building uh, an extension of a school or daycare, something like that. Uh, Reason.com put out this article, and uh, so he didn't have their permission. So he was like, yeah, all right, you know, you got me up guilty. Here's the $900 fine. Uh, I tore it down and got the uh, perfect permits to build it. Later, he got a bill from them for like $29,000 some dollars uh, because he has to now pay for uh, their prosecution of him, right? And, of course, he doesn't have that kind of money. Now they put a lien on his house. Wow. Uh, and, yeah, there's somebody's business uh, that they found like somebody comes up to the government and says hey uh we can get you back your money for these litigation costs up to maybe 100 percent right um and they kind of go after uh, all kinds of little building sort of stuff that goes on in neighborhoods but i'm kind of curious like how do the how do these people kind of find out about this sort of stuff right are there snitches in the neighborhood saying like you know i don't really particularly like the the shed of this and you know maybe you know phone call here uh get somebody out there to investigate that happens all the time with with private industry when, um, for instance, a lot of companies aren't, a lot of foreign companies aren't paying taxes for earnings that they create in the Gulf on oil drilling. And so they might be a foreign owned company and they're not paying any taxes on this for, through some loophole or whatever, or just because the IRS is not following through. And so local American companies are then reporting them. and. That's happening because the, these American companies are reporting them because they're like, oh, that's not a fair playing ground. We've got to have you know, the sa- them operating by the same rules because they can underbid our contracts. Right. Which 
So, so you see that in the United, I mean, everywhere in business, it's like, oh, so and so is not paying what I'm paying, and and even though that's better for the customer, ultimately, is they get a lower price. It's uh, it's them holding each other back. It, so. I think there's like some kind of things where like. If you're try- if you're an American trying to do business in other countries, you're not allowed to accept gifts or things like that. There's some kind of limits to that. Foreign corrupt practices, right? Yeah. But other countries, more than more than you know, there's no laws against them uh, <laughs> receiving or doing those things, right? Right. It's part of business, right? right. Like uh, yeah. in negotiations, or you know, going to a restaurant and eat, uh, you know, all this sort of stuff to kind of add on to uh, hopefully a favorable a mutual exchange of trade. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. The um... It's like the government, U.S. government's ability to regulate what happens on other soil, on soil that's not even U.S. soil. It becomes even, even more pervasive. It's pretty amazing. All right. So, are you related to uh, John F. Kennedy? <laughs> I, if I were, you know. All right. So I'll, I'll I'll say this. Jerry Seinfeld came to Richmond at the National, and he said. If you were me, and you know me, would you be in Richmond, Virginia right now? And I was like, well, probably not. But, <laughs> but I, So I say the same thing. If I were a Kennedy, a real Kennedy, probably not. Uh, I would not be here. You know, I'd probably be in, like, Martha's Vineyard or, well, that's not very warm right now. But. Well, I mean, I'm sure um, he has a lot of illegitimate bastards out there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure you know it's uh, his father. A great many sons. It's kind of like uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ned Stark's investigation into uh, <laughs> uh, what happened to the previous, uh, you know, uh, to the king. Jon Snow. Yeah. Right. Um, so could be. Who knows? Um, which yeah. brings into the question I want to talk about is: uh, Do you think then J- uh, George H. W. Bush had anything to do with JFK's assassination? That's an interesting question. Usually I hear, did he have anything to do with the Reagan attempt? But I, that is interesting. I'm not, um, I mean, a lot of people say that the CIA had something to do with it. And since um, Bush Sr. was so involved with the CIA, and to a greater degree than most people realize, you know, most people look him up on Wikipedia and say, oh, he was only in the CIA one year under Gerald Ford. Right. But um, a lot of people realize, well, he may have had longer connections with the CIA than that. So, um, yeah, I think it's I definitely the public is more and more convinced that JFK and the assassination was not um, everything that they reported it to be. Right. You know, I think that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> he does make a good uh, way of trying to conceal that he was there. Uh, there's been like some uh, investigations going on about whether or not he was there at this at the time, because mm. um, you find that uh, <laughs> there was a memo from J. Edgar Hoover referring to a briefing given uh, to a George Bush of the CIA mm. around the day after the assassination, uh, and so there's some things you can put together that shows that he was there, and he was there the day after, and he's made a good effort to conceal that fact. And say that that wasn't him, that he wasn't there. Uh, this, of course, would draw some more suspicion. There's a lot of suspicion around this guy for me in particular, because there's a lot of stuff about him that I don't know too well. Uh, I would say, um, but I guess if you're into the CIA and you have a long time of right. those kinds of cloak and daggers kind of operations, you'd make a good deal of effort to try and make sure there's not a lot out there on you. Right. I mean, JFK definitely showed a disdain for the CIA and said he was interested in um, getting rid of it and or right. undermining it at the very least. So I think there's there's definitely something to that. And, the you know, throughout the 20th century, I mean, the CIA is definitely the people inside of it have definitely been willing to uh, to go around the world and get people killed, you know, so it's it's it stands to reason. <laughs> I mean, they have a good experience in toppling governments, right? Who is to say that uh, they can't topple their own? Right. Right. Yeah. I, no, I, it's definitely, we're, we're so willing to believe other conspiracies. I mean, uh, the Russia Gate thing with Trump and everything. There's so many people that are quick to believe it. And, uh, and other, you know, other 
things that you hear about all the time. So I, I wouldn't be surprised um, if in, and even with 9-11, a lot of information's come out, you know, more recently that you hear. And it's surprising, to say the least. And if you'd known it back then, it might have made some of the people in government look a little more suspicious. So by the same token, knowing what we know now, um, and who's, who's to say we won't hear more information? You know? Right. Uh, so the anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day was a couple of days ago. And another 9-11, another secrecy, who's to say, uh, in terms of uh, toppling your own government, who's to say that they knew that the attacks were coming. Uh, they knew that it was not a surprise at all. And that's why they specifically had their aircraft carriers uh, away <laughs> from Pearl Harbor. Uh, they, they brought everybody in there, but you know, aircraft carriers take a long, longer time to build. Right. Uh, you know, so they would conveniently place them out further away from sea and allow the attack to happen. Right. I mean, uh, FDR did everything he could to get it to happen, basically. <laughs> right. I mean, you the uh, his treatment of the Japanese and pushing them in really into the arms of of the Germans stands as like uh, it, it just it didn't have to happen. And I think they made every effort the Japanese did. They weren't you know necessarily as evil as everyone uh, perceives the the Germans to be at the time. So it's not clear why they had to um, go down that same path as as the Germans and align themselves. But uh, that's what happened. And uh, they, they really, I mean, from if you look at it from their perspective at the time, they really had no other choice um, when they they had to had to do something in order to. Uh, they're an island nation, and so you know you wonder about uh, you you just wonder about why FDR is so lauded today. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, when you seize you freeze uh, Japanese assets, and then you uh, halt trade with Blockade, them, right? right. Blockades. Uh, and you know they they need that that oil right to kind of help fund uh, their machine as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, inevitably, it's kind of like a proverbial like elbow jab, you know, where publicly you know you do your uh, showcasing like you know we're friends, everything's cordial, but without anyone looking, you throw a proverbial you, you jab the person right maybe a few times when no one's looking, and then eventually the person's going to react right. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's how I started a fight one day, many years ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then it makes it look like you're innocent and the other person's at fault. Right. Uh, and so people can see them as the aggressor, right? Because Germany was inviting. Uh, they were sending uh, many warships to England. They are giving them a lot of money. Uh, so, like, in a way, they're uh, involved indirectly, uh, but Germany is not taking the bait. Right. And so another way you can go attack Germany would be through Japan, right? Yeah, uh, so that would be a clever way, right, to go about it. I mean, I, I need to do more uh, study on that that issue. But one great source of information that I've I've used is um, Pat Buchanan's book. Um, it's called Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, and he goes into detail about how um, it, just that everything FDR did that could have con- and he also goes into the idea of this sort of northeastern elite at the time. In the United States and how they really identified more so with the UK and the, and by the same token Churchill identified very strongly with the United States and that Northeastern establishment too because he his mother was an American um, so it's the connections that they had the the degree of trust that he had that kind of hurt both sides mm-hmm. when uh, one of the things uh, Buchanan points out in the book is that the UK never really reached the same level of power, especially naval power, that they had had um, prior to World War One, and that was uh, and and you know if you connect the two wars, World War Two as well. Right. Uh, there was a lot of uh, I guess resistance in trying to get involved in a the war. There are a lot of Germans here, again, of course, and nobody wants to get involved in with another <laughs> war with the Germans. Um, there was a Gallup poll that showed uh, 80% of Americans opposed U.S. involvement, right, uh, in another European war. Uh, and you find, like, before U.S. involvement, even in the first war, every time for, like, in the entire history of Europe, it's been rife sometimes with wars every, every once in a while. But the, after it ends, after, like, Napoleon does his reach or Spain does their reach or even England or France, uh, everything kind of goes back to its natural borders uh, of their own people, so to speak. Uh, so it's not like um, 
like there's ever been like one that's ever been strong enough to conquer all of Europe. Uh, and inevitably, these kind of wars kind of settle themselves out uh, and goes to where we're thinking kind of like a mutual agreement and how to settle this peacefully. Um, and of course, with the U.S. involvement, everything changed. Uh, There's a clear winner, and now you can you know blame everything on the Germans. Uh, so I would say, as an extension of um, the United States involvement of that, you can say that it helped cause World War II. Um, and of course, leading up to the Cold War after that, uh, and then leading to, again, the person that just died recently, George Bush. Right. And you will think that after the Cold War, like in like uh, World War II 3.0, uh, that things would settle or come down a bit after that. Um, but you find that's, that was not the case. Um, right. Arms buildups and, yeah, the, uh, the situation that arose, it seems, you know, the what you were talking about with people who identify with their group or their countries, you know, settling into the place that um, they have their strongest loyalty to. So if you're um, if you're a German living in the Alsace Lorraine part of, uh, I'm probably butchering that, but uh, <laughs> between France and Germany, then you say, um, you know, okay, I, I'm German. I want to live, you know, closer. Or if you're a German living in the Czech Republic. Uh, there, th these were difficult uh, decisions, and no matter what, I mean, Woodrow Wilson said about um, self-determination for all peoples that really didn't seem to be the case ultimately. And um, But you can see also in George Bush's life and going into um, the Cold War era, after World War II in the Middle East, the, a lot of the decisions by the UK especially created what we're still dealing with today as far as the conflicts that George Bush Sr. ended up um, getting us into and having zero statesmanship or, or understanding of history or, right. <laughs> or anything, really. He, he, uh, he, people see him as this great uh, figure for, oh, he got, us, he got us in and out of Iraq and it, and it was quick and, quick and dirty and we defended the, um, the autark you know, in um, Kuwait, and uh, they they were able to retain power, and they were our friends, and uh, Saddam was our enemy, our sworn enemy, and it's always been that way. Right. You know, when in reality, those those borders were were written up just as poorly as the post World War One borders. Right. Especially and, in the Middle East. Right. Especially with uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, yeah, uh, with no uh, insight to the people that actually live there. Right. right and creates uh, all this strife that continues today um yeah i, th I think uh maybe he would not have been a good person to be in be i mean uh in terms of, like presidency there's like the, my favorite president is that uh henry guy who uh what, died in a couple it's a few days in office yeah um, william henry harrison yeah yeah <laughs> the best kind of president best kind of president you can have. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the bush really came at the wrong time. Uh, he was the, the worst possible guy who could have entered the presidency in that situation, post-Cold War, right. with Russians who were who were done, and so here's his opening right. to get involved in the Middle East. Oh, what else create, can I mess around right. with, right? <laughs> there's, there's no one to check me anymore, right? Right. Yeah, the, yeah, the Russians weren't going to do anything. No, let's invade Panama. Who's going to say anything? So uh, an important quote about that whole Arab uh, conflict uh, in 1990, July 25th, 1990, um, Bush's U.S. ambassador to Baghdad met with Saddam Hussein, and she's quoted as saying in their interview, in their discussions, uh, she says, I know you need funds, and Saddam, I guess, is complaining about his debt situation and everything with Kuwait, um, but for, for our purposes, that's not a hugely important issue. But she says, I know you need funds. We understand that, and our opinion is that you should have the opportunity to rebuild your country. But we have no opinion on the Arab Arab conflicts, like your border disagreement with Kuwait. And uh, this is April Glaspie, July 25th, 1990. The Gulf War started on August 2nd, 1990. And so a lot of people believe this, her, her words to Saddam really gave him the impression that it didn't matter. Uh, right. If he invaded Kuwait, 
uh, we have no we have no opinion. And a lot of people might have thought he was just going to cross into Kuwait and settle this issue that he was having with some oil fields that he felt they were cross drilling into. But uh, it's such a weird situation, and you could either view it as Bush purposely bungled this situation, or he wanted to get into war in the Middle East be, to defend his friends in right. Saudi Arabia. And why not flex more military strength, uh, something you haven't been able to do as much um, during the Cold War, right? So here's an opportunity. And I mean, I think the flexing is interesting because I think it just shows how, I think you can say badass, um, American forces uh, are our are, are capability for violence right. and for it to uh, be done quickly. Well, like what, two days or something like that, right? hundred days is a very short, short amount of time. Right. Um, no long uh, engagements and wars have passed that will spread for for years. Um, and I think that, aside from statism, all that, all, all aside, yeah. I think uh, is interesting of uh, the inefficiency of, uh, of, of of that kind of escalation of violence and ending it so quickly. Um, but of course, you know, things get political after that. And, you know, people are there and we're still there today. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, not so long before that, we were supporting Saddam uh, in his war against Iran at the time. So there, you know, we were giving him weapons and, and some of those very same or at least we were giving him equipment. And uh, much of that equipment, you know, probably ended up being used against us. Uh, so. Right. It, it, it's such a bizarre situation um, that we shouldn't ever be surprised why these things happen. We supported, you know, Bin Laden, of course, but yeah, our military was so much more powerful than than his. And it's just so so insane. And I guess he must have been deranged to think that he was going to to win that. It kind of reminds me of like the propagandists that they had uh, during the the second invasion that was saying like, you know, we're we're uh, pushing the Americans. Uh, back across the desert, I forgot his name, but it was this wild propagandist that was just saying all these deranged statements that were like, uh, like saying like, we've, we're beating them back, we've, we've got this, we're, we're, uh, we're heading that on to them, like head to head, toe to toe, you know, gun to gun. Um, and did, did you ever hear about this guy? You know, so he was uh, uh, someone that just, uh, just could not believe what was happening uh, during the war and just continued spouting out all this stuff uh, in the newspaper. <laughs> saying like, oh, we've, we're winning, we're beating them. And uh, despite it being over, again, rather quickly within a week. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, Bush, uh, you know, in terms of his funeral, uh, he won't re re be remembered for his war crimes. He won't be remembered for, uh, you know, there's there bombings of hospitals. There's still a lot of people that still died during that war. Uh, and for what involvement, you know, what reason did we have to be in there, right? Uh, in what way was uh, our American lives uh, threatened, right, for us right. to act uh, in such a way? Right. It's so sad when you think also about the uh, people that were, the men that were drafted into his military because they weren't there, um, you know, they didn't choose to be in his, uh, Saddam's armed forces. Right. Um, they, were, they were forced to be there and their families were going, going to be killed if they didn't join. So that was, that was the way it happened in Iraq. And so for the U.S. military to go through there and just blow them all away, and uh, you know, with that, and at the time, I believed, I believe that Saddam Iraq, uh, that military was like the fourth largest by person by by count hmm. individual uh, in the United in the world. So <laughs> that tells you something about how how expansive he was, and he was just throwing bodies, you know, it, right. it, it didn't really matter. And a lot of them did just, uh, a lot of his soldiers just gave up too, which is smart. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the rest of the world outside, I mean, people don't people don't really realize how much how fortunate they are to be here in the U.S. versus uh, everywhere else, I would say, most places, uh, where it's continue with, uh, with rife or like, uh, or, you know, you're making like a dollar in Indonesia, which can sometimes, if you're in a sweatshop, of course, that's higher than the... Uh, natural average right right um but I, I think a lot of them maybe have watched the movies here and think that you know there's nothing but terminators running <laughs> in the army rambos uh you know it's like i've seen this movie yeah <laughs> i don't want to be on the end of that mm. um yeah happily give up <laughs> yeah there's uh i i think there it, it is amazing how people have sort of a dual 
uh, view of the United States when you go outside of the United States and talk to them. You know, on the one hand, they love our music and our movies and all these various aspects of our culture, and that's the real America when you think about it. Yeah. At the end of the day, they also hate the fact that we're involved in virtually everything and influencing the despots in their countries and and our military has a base in their country maybe or or what have you so yeah there's there's growing um and i i don't it's not going to last forever you know that empire won't happen that could have been bush's senior's legacy and de-escalating right and right. uh shutting down these bases and going back to a time of, uh, of a peace and kind of revel in that um but yeah it shows otherwise um how long do you think until he starts voting Democrat now? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, at least the Bush clan, right? They, uh, they're... That's right. I think they actually uh, advocated for Hillary. <laughs> right. It just goes to show everybody's true colors. I mean, they never really cared about cutting taxes or any right. of that stuff. It was always about uh, the war machine and the power of the government to, to grow and get bigger. And, and not to say that Trump is reducing the size of the government at all, but um, just to say that they, it's about that, you know, when you look at somebody like Hillary, she's died in the wool for the military state and the ability of it to go around the world and accomplish all of her objectives. So, all right. I like the, um, when Jeb Bush was running for presidency, somebody asked uh, his mom uh, what she thought, you know, about that. And she said, ah. We have had too many Bushes in the White House. I think it's time for someone else to be in charge. <laughs> Poor Jeb. Poor he, Jeb. Yes, yes, Barbara. He was like, please love me. Please love me. Yeah, instead of please clap. I'm right here, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, could you imagine, uh, you know, your brother being chosen as, uh, let's say, the, just the homecoming king or something like that. And, right. And then your mom's like, I don't know if you should be, John. Um, it's not it's not your, your brother, time. Your brother was once uh, the homecoming king, and <laughs> I think we should give other people a chance. It's like, God damn it, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's um. Did you, did, did you watch that video of when they were all sitting together? Mm. Uh, so you have uh, the Clintons uh, here, right. and then you had uh, the Obamas here, and then you had Trump and Melania coming in to sit down. Oh, right, right. Yeah, did you watch that? Yeah, uh, I saw a few a few clips. It was at the funeral, right? It's gonna be the most, yeah, uncomfortable thing uh, in terms of like, well, so, <laughs> um, so but first, uh, Bush is coming in, coming in, and he hands Mel, uh, Michelle some candy, right? Um, <laughs> There's some weird thing that goes on, I'm not sure right. what that's about. Um, so before Trump arrives, arrives um, you have the Clinton sitting here, you have Obama sitting here, Michelle here, Bill Clinton and uh, Hillary over here to the side. Um, and then you have Trump coming in. And of course, there's no acknowledgement between Hillary and right. Trump. And there's like, Trump is coming out there to reach out, you know, shake hands of Obama and Michelle acknowledges them. It doesn't give a signal out there to, at all that he acknowledged that they were there. But you can see like Bill, right. you know, he, he, he wants to be a fun guy, right? You know, he's, right. He wants to, he, Place to sax, right? Uh, <laughs> he he, he kind of looks over and he's kind of like, you know, he looks Hello. over to his wife too and he's like, oh, all right, I don't, I don't want to be beaten up tonight, I guess. Um, and I would say that's got to be the most awkward exchange of our, uh, during that time. Um, right. I thought that was just hilarious. Yeah, they're, they're a weird little um, elite cadre of people that, yeah. that populate that little, that little bench, you know, and, and they're just, um, they're, not necessarily um, like she was cool with him right up until he started pushing back on her power. Right. right? You can see old photos of them. Yeah, hanging out. There, Freaking, she's laughing, yeah. and and you know she knew everything he believed back then. I mean, he was it probably was a Democrat at one point. Right. Right. Yeah. But he was probably still talking smack about uh, Obama not being born here or something yeah. like that. And she didn't care. You know, this is. Uh... Was he born here? Uh, well, that's another conspiracy. We can <laughs> entire. We can entire. He's got a brother. Nothing Alex. surprises me. I will tell you that. He's got a, I think, a half brother or something in in Africa somewhere who's got a Twitter account. Uh, is this always uh, jiving? Malik, Malik Obama. Malik, yeah. Yes, I follow. I follow him extensively. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's um, that. That's that could easily. You know, there. 
even if he is born here, um, it's so bizarre. I don't think anybody should be able to be president. So, you know, I don't think. It's... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it's such a bizarre um, group of people that run the, you know, have these strings of power. And yet they're not really, um, I guess they don't really get to accomplish everything that they seek out. And in Trump's case, you can definitely see that where the state and the, the um, deep state is arrayed against him. Whereas when you see someone like W or uh, Bush Senior get into office or the the Clintons, the ever the the red carpet is laid right out before them, right? Right. So we can see that there's definitely something to that, I think. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, there there, it's a strange person who wants to go and uh, be seen in in power and go to those events. And, yeah, yeah. Have you been to the National Cathedral? I have not. Uh, been, didn't you been say you lived the, in D.C. once? I, I've, I've never been. I've only been to the Shrine. To the Shrine. Right. The Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Right. It's right. got a long shrine. name. It's the Shrine uh, of the Immaculate. Now, I think it's, you know, there you got the Shrine, and then you got, like, basilicas. So it's right. like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, no, I think um, I, the, I think the National Cathedral is supposed to be pretty nice. I've just, I know it got hurt by that. Uh, it, a little bit of the tower broke when we had that earthquake. Oh, yeah, so. that's right. That's right. They're still doing some construction on that. Right. Uh, they have a Darth Vader uh, gargoyle up there. You can find it. Uh, it's a beautiful place. they got a moon rock, if it is a moon rock. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Assuming we <laughs> did go to the Well, moon. the thing is, they said that uh, <laughs> these moon rocks that they gave out to, like, these uh, politicians in other countries when they came back, they did some tests on them. It turns out that they're not real moon rocks. But mm. at the same time, it could also be said that Maybe the moon rocks got switched out in those other countries, right? Right. And I was like, "What moon rock? Yeah, put some dirt there." Yeah. Um, well, uh, I should I should mention then that Steph Stefan Curry was recently quoted as saying that he doubted the uh, the moon landing to like a little girl on I believe he said it on Twitter, but on it Twitter, could be, okay. it could have been to a little girl. Yeah. I mean, there's there's another video of a, some guys talking to a girl. Like I don't know, maybe we did. But I think it was teasing. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so we'll say we'll have to bring up. Uh, flat earth theory at some point and see if we can actually prove them wrong right here in this room um ridiculous but i would say i am a flat moon theorist because uh, you only ever see one side of the moon right right yeah. so that's all the information you have that's all the information we have yeah, how are you supposed to know all right exactly yeah <laughs> hey you know so if you're a true uh philosophical skeptic you know then you can't then you don't believe in anything you can't prove you know right and, right. and it's not up to you to prove something that uh, uh, it's not, the onus is not on to you to prove a positive, right? Mm -hmm. So show me some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, picture yeah. get out. <laughs> Come on, Buzz Aldrin. I'm expecting a call in any moment from Buzz Aldrin. He can explain. He can explain. I think uh, still alive? Woodrow Wilson is buried in turn at the National Cathedral. Um, and so mm -hmm. interesting fact: I used to live in D.C. So a lot of people think that the Washington Monument is uh, is the highest point in the region. Right. Right. Uh, and you can't build any buildings higher than the Washington Monument. Uh, it turns out, actually, that's wrong. The National Cathedral technically is the largest building, the tallest building, because uh, it sits on a hill. Mm -hmm. So it's taller than the Washington Monument. And going back to regulations and why people don't build, right. uh, there, were, there was this Egyptian building, a hotel. They wanted to build a hotel. Uh, their competitors got jealous of it because it was going to be the largest one in this in DC. Right. Uh, so they got city council to pass a law saying, "All right, you cannot have a building taller than the one across the street from you, plus the width of the street between you, or something like to that effect." So if buildings were to ever go taller in DC, they will go slowly, right? Because you can't build it taller than the one across the street from you, plus the width. So you have to kind of like destroy it or have hopefully they build and continue building back and forth but that never happens Oof. yeah yeah that'd be expensive all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the uh it, it's one of the things i think that you and i can definitely connect on because dc being a city that just by its architecture alone makes it not a great place to to be uh it seems like it's it's a weird it, it like you can't fit a lot of people per square block. That's true. Yeah. That, that, so it's that, unfortunate in that respect too. That aspect of it is uh, what well, sucks. Um, 
I think behind like San Francisco, they're like the third worst traffic congestion in the country, right? This by not having the same amount of population. Um, so it's like follows closely behind New York and San Francisco, LA. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's that's why. Um, so, and I used to live in DC only because I was in uh, in the military, Bowling Air Force Base, it has no airplanes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're base. Um, so I didn't have any problems with traffic congestion myself, but when you go out there, if you want to meet other people, it takes like an hour to get anywhere. Uh, you kind of have to make friends in the same zip code area. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's like NASCAR racing, bumper to bumper. Um, I think mm-hmm. that's where I got my good driving skills from. Down yeah. There. Richmond's a cakewalk. <laughs> oh, yeah. After after uh, moving down, after living in D.C., coming down to Richmond and hearing people complain about traffic, it's, uh, it's always amusing. Yeah, the... Um, it's it's also just the i guess there's like during the day i've heard it's like the average population of dc is like 1.2 million yeah whereas on the weekends it might be like six or seven hundred thousand so no one actually goes there to um to to actually hang out and stay they know their identity is not based in dc either you know their sports team or whatever that they support it could be anywhere in the country yeah. right so in, in that sense too it's it's not as uh, then people aren't committed to living there. <laughs> all right. All right. I will say I do love all the all that stuff though. Yeah. I will say I love all the. Uh, I know there are state of statues, monuments to them, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> I understand that, but I do like <laughs> I do like the classical Greek designs. I do mm-hmm. like that there's a statue of Neptune outside of um, the Congress of Library. Um, I do like, uh, if you look at all these kind of government buildings that they do have this kind of, uh, I guess, Western civilization style buildings still around sure. that haven't been like modernized. So you can say then it's happening like all, places in Europe where they tear down all these traditional buildings and they kind of erect a, you know, it's, it's a block, you know, it's supposed to be new, it's different, you know, right. think outside the block, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but that's because I live in DC. I don't have to, you know, face the traffic. If I lived outside of D.C. trying to get into D.C., yeah, that'll be different. Yeah, right. of course. Um, but of course, you know, put a, a bust of Lysander Spooner out there or something like that. You know, they say that uh, yeah. the Lincoln Memorial at one point, uh, you want to see like how weird 1984 this could have gone. Uh, they were thinking about putting it, uh, the Lincoln Memorial inside a pyramid. Right. So like in one mm-hmm. of the stories of uh, 1984, you know, you had these pyramid shaped buildings uh, and that could have been, you know. Wow. Yeah. Out there. How appropriate. Yeah, how appropriate. <laughs> yeah. I know that, uh, was it Jefferson or Washington was really interested in obelisks, like obelisk uh, Egyptian type architecture. Yeah. As a form, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure why, but uh, it's always interesting how they. The Masons, right? They're the ones who pull the strings, no, as are, you know. Yeah. I was in um, <laughs> Tybee Island a couple years ago in, in uh, Georgia, it's off the coast of Georgia. Tybee Island is also a place where. They lost a nuclear missile, so mm-hmm. people bring up the argument like, you know, what about nuclear weapons? Like, what about the one that the U.S. government lost off the coast of Tybee Island? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's radiation out there. Uh, they still can't find it to this day. Um, mm-hmm. But near there, there was this old fort, and as I'm like uh, cruising around, just exploring this place, I'm like, all right, there's a fort. These cars are parked outside of it, and I go inside the fort. I go to there, there's no one attending the entrance, but there's an elevator there, and I go up the elevator, press a number. And the number stops at like, uh, there's like maybe five sto- five floors. At like the third floor, I get off, and there's there is literally a guy standing like maybe 30 feet away from me at an altar with candles lit up, and it's very dark and everything like that. And I'm like pushing the next button to go up as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to get uh, sacrificed. Yeah, or no, something. I, I've seen this movie. <laughs> gonna pull your heart out right yeah uh so the next button takes me up to the top floor a lot of old people um i think these are shriners of some sort uh eating there's like it's a banquet of some sort some someone push, approaches me and uh, and i pretend i lie my ass off and i pretend like i'm part of like um the shriners from alexandra here in dc oh yeah you know it's like you're like suspiciously look at me it's like i know they're not believing me but you know they're acknowledging it's it's okay for now and they're like, oh, come here. Come and sit down with us and uh, enjoy yourselves. Uh-oh. And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, yes, I shall. Yes, uh, you know, I will. As I'm walking around, uh, I'll say I was in there for like a minute before I jumped out the window. 
uh, and climbed off the um, the fortress. Uh, again, I've seen this movie. I don't want to be. Able to... <laughs> I don't want to be the main course. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrifying. It's terrifying. It is. <laughs> you know, like it's always uh, funny how either they've got some kind of bizarre like rituals that are just entertainment for them, or they really do want someone like you to wander in. And uh, they want to sacrifice you. There is no one there stopping me from entering that elevator. <laughs> but I mean, it's Tybee Island. It's off the coast. It's pretty far away. So I guess they didn't expect any like wandering, uh, hunch trunk, uh, you know, <laughs> tourists coming through or something like that. So well, that that Masonic temple in Alexandria, of course, is a big. You know, that's obviously very old. But uh, yeah, have I've you never been never been. No, yeah. I have. Yeah. Go, so Did you like climb on the roof or something? I know, right? <laughs> Interrupt one of their. <laughs> If you go on Sundays, the whole place is actually pretty quiet. And you could go downstairs to the basement and sneak your way in there, and there's, like, nobody there, really. Uh, and you can go on the stage and try on the hats mm. and the uniform. I've done it. Uh, <laughs> you have any photos? Pixar didn't no, happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Pixar didn't happen. I do have a friend who, who I, I took with me to, to do these things with. Her. I did have a friend who I took with me to that place in Tybee Island. So I took her and was like, yeah, what the hell? We need to get out of here. Yeah. Wow. I know. Um, but hmm. secret societies, I think uh, Senior Boast was part of one, right? Skulls and Bones or something. Skull and like Bones. That. I believe W was also. Right. Part How can of you it. trust people like that, right? Right. <laughs> Their whole life is built in cover op, uh, right. operations. Yeah, you have to uh, you have to wonder about how these guys. Well, they they don't seem all that bright. I mean. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, Bush. Yeah, was he behind nine eleven? I don't think he knew what was going on. I don't on. think he could have. Figured I think his that handler, out. Dick Cheney, is the one that kind of is pulling the strings. He's like, Dad, part. I don't want to be a part of Skull and Bones. I don't <laughs> care what you say about. And yeah, he's a he's a strange. Um, he, he's almost I don't know. He's he's like a he's like a kid. You know, he gives candy to Michelle yeah. and thinks that's funny or something. He's... <laughs> Today he's like just painting portraits. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh, we were going to talk also about the Americans with Disabilities Act. I think that was another that 90s. is like the most punishing thing that he could have done to industry, free markets, uh, to people. Uh, you see it everywhere. I think for the most part, most of our lives is impacted by it, whether we see it or not. Or if, I mean, it's not something you're cognizant about, but like every business you go into is impacted by it. And so... The cost of going to these businesses, people talk about minimum wage, but like you also have to pay for like widened doors, you have to pay for like maybe hand guards in the bathroom, you have to pay for ramps, the doors have to be widened, there's a specific dimension and size the doors have to be, you can't have levers, it has to be because it's ableist right. to have like round door knobs or something like that. Um, the way that the doors would fall back and the time frame the door closes and the month's weight that is attributed to it. Um, and then the bars that you go to, to like, I don't know, like a, a diner or something like that, you know, it's how well it has to be uh, adjusted towards the American Disability Act. Right. Um, so I think that it has been, I think that's his legacy, <laughs> destroying a, a lot of, uh, I guess, profit, uh, prosperity, things that. Right. It, it's, you know, the government always likes to take things that sound really good. You know, they, there's always uh, programs for kids to be able to eat, or if they want to, if they want to provide health care, it's, well, it's children need health care or something like that. Right. And with, and so how could you be opposed to people with disabilities having the things that they need in order to be able to access the businesses that you you go to yourself? And uh, so it, there's all sorts of um, arguments like that, and yet. Today we find that there's entire cottage industries devoted to people being able to uh, people in wheelchairs and being able to enter certain places, certain communities, and, te and they'll just go up and test whether that handicap button on that door works. And if it doesn't, they'll sue. And um, they have, you know, this is their, this is what they do for a living, practically. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's unfortunate because while that may not have been the intention. It certainly is. The, it's always the result of, of that type of legislation. I mean, and <clears throat> what was happening before the ADA? You know, where mm -hmm. uh, handicapped people being thrown in the streets. Get out of my bar! Right. 
<laughs> no, old man Potter had somebody taking care of him, you pushing him around town. You know, uh, <laughs> walker of a human being or something. Get out of here with the right. crutch, right? Right. Yeah, The uh, I think ultimately the the best way to handle anything like this is to say, oh, I know somebody who you know has this and I'm going to talk to the management, see what they can do, you know, see how they can make it work for their company instead of this overarching um, program where you have 50 handicap spots that are not being used. Right. Um, <laughs> like you maybe have uh, one person that sometimes has difficulty walking and now you have to um, you know, put in ten, twenty thousand dollars and fixing the doorway and make sure there's a ramp you know, for one customer instead of like, hey, if you're here, let us know and we'll come out there and help you in. And we have a different ramp that you could just kind of put right. out there, right? Um, make it easy, right? And uh, I think that's, I don't think it's, um, it helps these kinds of people and say, hey, you can't help yourself. You can't figure out your own solutions to go out there and, you know, and enjoy life like everyone right. else, right? And uh, sure, humanity, <laughs> enjoy drinks and go places. We have no idea the technology that would that could be created also if, right. if these regulations didn't take place. And, uh, you know, the, the government steps in and creates this overarching system, but somebody else might have said, okay, well, I'm going to invent a, um, a new wheelchair that can that can walk up steps. And or, I've seen those right. now, right? Yeah, there's, there's uh, wheelchairs that helps people kind of walk up those steps. Right. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, how they say, like, well, you know, government legis legislated um, the uh, kids can work, you know, sort of thing, or like these labor laws, for example. A lot of this stuff, businesses already put into place. The government later comes in to legislate into being. So the market already puts into place uh, weekends off. Market puts into place uh, nine to five. Right. Uh, right. Ford did all that. Right. Double your salary. And right? they take credit for it. They too. take credit for it. Right. right. Because it gets legislated into a law, kind of like uh, patents. Like even if you invented something, right? If someone patents it, they get credit for it instead because they went to government, right. right? And they fill out the paperwork. Now they get credit for saying they're the first to do it. Right. Um, like the Wright brothers. Right. And so. Right. Uh, I think this is the similar kind of case. I think a lot of people, you know, I've never met anyone say, yeah, you know, fuck the handicap. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those people. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's universally understood. Like once you hit it, also once you hit a certain age, maybe you were when you were a kid, you know, somebody, somebody was immature or something. But once you hit a certain age, you're like, oh, no, handicap. Like we all like them. And right. we, all, we don't pick on them. <laughs> and yet, uh, it, so I, it, there's got to be, you know, for even the hardest um, questions, you know, people want to test you and say, how do you feel about the environment? How do you feel about Americans with disabilities? And, uh, you know, you just you just begin to realize that the more government enters into these different things, the more um, damage takes place. And these these people aren't are, are then not given opportunities that they might otherwise uh, have been given, especially, I think, when there is a hiring decision and there needs to be, um, you know, they're not. Someone's not sure whether they can do the job. There could always be a telecommuting option too. But instead right. of that, it's uh, well, I can't hire you. You know. Right. Yeah, they can't ask you specifically what kind of handicap problems you have. Right. Um, and I think it does for it. Like, look, I spent tens of thousands of dollars to provide for you. I don't really care anymore. Right. I'm forced to now provide all these accommodations. Um, Right. Well, you've, you've taken my money, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to give you know two shits about right. Somebody who anymore. somebody who could have uh, done a job, let's say, if you if you have a disability and your disability makes it more difficult for you to do that job, you might be willing to accept less uh, compensation than someone who yeah. is is uh, more capable. And so instead of that, they don't let you negotiate that way. Right? They say, you know, you have to be on the same level as the person who's fully capable. And uh, ironically. Then you're hurting the disabled, disabled person who can't um, use their disability to negotiate because they say, "Hey, I'm just as smart as that person. Maybe right. My my left arm doesn't work or whatever." You know? I've seen those Facebook videos uh, of like some guy in some third world country, you know, doing construction without an arm, doing so fast. You know, right. they they found a method to kind of do it, or you know, putting tires on, you know, they, you know, without a leg or both legs. You know, it's like kind of figuring out a way to do it, like the fastest way I've ever seen. Right. Yeah. Without like heavy machinery or anything like that, 
Uh, and these people are not out there like, oh, po- whoa, it's me. It's like, look, I'm, I want a job. I want money. I like capitalism. I want to provide for my family. Um, you don't need strangers who don't know your condition, what you can and can't do, kind of be involved. And right. I think a lot of these people, without those kinds of American disability acts in their countries, uh, you, you, you'll find a lot of people going like out there and I think going a step and beyond, beyond uh, and be able to show like they can perform those duties um, and not make it a hindrance or right. you know a delay in progress and productivity or something like that. Uh, because yeah, I think for the most part of you hire because of these things that are set into place, you have, uh, like you mentioned, like these lawyer sharks looking around to shoe people, you know, uh, yeah. like if you get employed, like if I employ someone like that now, because of these laws, like you're likely to take advantage of that and say that the whole place is ableist, the whole place is set against you and, um, you know, everything has to change this tens of thousands of dollars again, again, um, because of those changes. So I don't particularly think that this is the best uh, this is sta- disables this disables americans this disables the people who need those help and people who would want to hire them right and then you get lazy bums like me just pressing on that handicap button <laughs> just because i don't feel like opening right, the door right. myself i once <laughs> i lived in dc people say it was, they had a bad time i have a lot of dc stories uh another reason why i love living in dc uh outside from bullying because i lived like all around dc from like Bowie to uh, false shirts, fair effects everywhere, um, was that, uh, and Northern Virginia is a suburb of D.C., mm-hmm. right? Uh, I had a handicap placard, so. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me how I got go. it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had rock star parking wherever I went. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you get two hours for free. You don't have to have to pay anything. Right. And there's nobody there all the time, right? So I'm parking in, in those places in D.C., for a good number of years, uh, and it was like the best thing ever. Um, yeah. yeah, I've I've used. I, I'd, I'd walk out and pretend I have like. Oh, right, right. Oh, okay. I didn't go that far, but I did <laughs> take my mom to a baseball game at one time, and definitely made sure she brought her handicap. She was she had a, had a surgery or something on her leg, so I was able to get that um, sweet sweet handicap part. Oh, there you go. Yeah, at the, <laughs> at the Camden Yards, but uh. <laughs> but it, it's um, oh, and there's I'm sure there's you know this that just leads into all the problems that are created by, of course, people taking advantage of the system who right. who are barely disabled. I mean, right. if you can even say that. You you certainly see the people who absolutely have needs uh, with wheelchairs and everything. But then you see somebody get out of the car who's like like you, you know, just yeah. like hobbling and grabbing their leg. Um, <laughs> so. Uh. It's a wild jungle out there, as Upton Sinclair was saying. So, you know, it's a way to survive and get the best parking spot and make sure you have rock star parking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it, you know, there's... there's well, yeah, I, I, think, of, yeah. I think it's... Um, <laughs> I think it's uh, a detriment to a lot of those people anyways. Again, just so it's kind of like um, <clears throat> uh, firm of action, right? Firm of action says that uh, <laughs> if you're not white... Uh, yeah, yeah, we you can't do it on your own. So uh, we're going to give you a certain number of points towards your position in school or college or workplace of employment, right? Right. Um, so hey, you're uh, handicapped. You can't do it on your own. You can't, you know, uh, go out there. It's like other other people. Right. Uh, and sometimes you know, handicap is sometimes the inevitable thing. What happens to most people, anyways, right? How sure. do we get along this entire, you know, thousands of years without this law, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's uh, it's another way of saying that uh, you can't make it without government, right? Right. Uh, and if uh, if you can, if or, or to kind of sidestep your own personal negotiations with the business owner, so yeah, I love your place. I want to check it out. But the weirdest thing about that, I think, is I view a business place as I do as like being my own house. Right, uh, like even if you own the property or you're renting it, like yeah. it's that's that's your space, right? You're the uh, um, property title ship owner of that, even temporary, right? Sure. It's the negotiation, so you can't like uh, you're forced to kind of accommodate like guests coming into your house, your space, right? Uh, and that's how you all businesses like a, a bakery. That's pretty much my house. You can say, and I'm inviting people to come in, right? Right. <laughs> and taste these treats. Um, and someone comes in and they can't come in. Yeah, I would love for you to come in. Yeah, let's figure out a way out for you to come in. Right. right? Um, 
instead of this uh, blanking sweeping government regulation that kind of forces everyone, forces them to accommodate, uh, perhaps are the needs in which nobody really kind of needs. Kind of like this uh, GRT transit coming around in uh, Richmond right, right. now. Yeah. Nobody wants to use that. Nobody wants to use that. There's, well, there's like <laughs> Underwriters uh, Laboratory that provides their seal on a lot of uh, products, especially like, I guess, tools and equipment and Home Depot type stuff that you might buy. And so they rate this stuff and they say, okay, this, is, this meets our, our qualifications or our certifications. So you could have a similar nonprofit organization that's totally un unrelated to government right. that could go around and say, you know, this company doesn't really provide any way for people with with disabilities to, to go there. And uh, so here, you know, here's our rating for them. Yeah, I think they do that with food. I think there's already like some kind of, like what's in your food? Is it like organic, non-organic, some kind of um, nonprofit organization that does that? Uh, it kind of goes out of their way for that. I was just thinking about like, what if, uh, like, <laughs> like what about left-handed people, right? <laughs> like should we, should government get in the way and say, make sure that, uh, Make sure every tool you have is also left-handed uh, <laughs> uh, compatible, right? Ambidextrous, right. right? If it's not, well, you know, you're gonna have to make sure that it is because it kind of goes against it. It's very uh, anti-left-handed est. <laughs> I don't know what the word, ableist? Yes. <laughs> what would you consider left-handed people ableist? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, when they write <laughs> on the board, they're kind of erasing what they write, you know? They, you, Right. Yeah. 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 They gotta have that taken away. They gotta. <laughs> they gotta be forced to write with their right hand. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Is that, I mean, it's at that point, you, you kind of set up uh, the precedent for. And that's how most of these laws work, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just one little law against uh, gun rights, and then things kind of build up up upon from from that. Right. Right. As just one little tax, and things kind of build up to a couple of generations away. It's like fuck. It's a twenty percent increase now. Right. Right. Um, so anyways, that's how. That's how liberty is eroded incrementally. Invariably, it becomes the, the you know, someone has a need that is, uh, well, you might have a religious or a cultural opposition to whatever they're doing, but then that becomes the new disability that you must accommodate, right? right. You can imagine a situation involving that invariably, I, or at the very least with, um, you know, the, the, whole, <laughs> the whole libertarian discussion about baking the cake. For example, so right. that that's how the foot gets in the door, and um, so we got to be you know always be on guard. And instead of enabling people to do the do what they believe is the right thing to do, without government uh, showing up at their their door and saying people generally guns. do, yeah, people are generally great and awesome here. I've come to find here in the U.S. Um, versus my experience in Bolivia, uh, people here in the United States are great, awesome. Uh, I think. Uh, I, th I, th I think there are the cultural values. I guess this whole thing, like, what do they say? Like, if you change, like, the whole population of the United States with Canada or you know, Mexico or Bolivia, right? It's not <laughs> the same country, right? So cultural attitudes, just uh, the norms, just the, uh, the culture that they share uh, in terms of uh, how they view certain way of life. Um, that's kind of responsible for these sort of things. That's what pushes, yeah, that's what pushes change more than anything is, reading about it and hearing about it right and and saying man that's not right or something you know and instead of saying when it when you say it's not right instead of saying we need to pass a law you should just say i'm not going to accept that you know in my life right yeah yeah <laughs> done yeah you don't need to legislate that right yeah right. easy right exactly unfortunately you don't you don't see that and yet so and thus you end up with people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Yes, yeah. I keep having problem trying to say her whole entire name. Um, it's a mouthful. It's a memeful. I, would say. <laughs> I think that's something that's like Vox recently is trying to, to put out. Like you know maybe you can have an acronym for like AOC. Right. You know, always on to communism or something. I don't know. That, that would be my acronym. acronym. <laughs> um, the funny thing about it is, uh, so she came out recently. This is very hilarious. So Donald J. Uh, Trump Jr., right, he's a kid, made it be making fun of uh, her, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and uh, the mean comments was saying, like, why are you so afraid of socialist uh, economy? <laughs> and all right, so, like, it's a picture of her, and then underneath her is Trump. <laughs> and so it's quoting Trump saying, because Americans want to walk their dogs and not eat them. 
right? I think that's a good uh, honest assessment, especially if you yeah. know what's going on in Venezuela, <laughs> all right? People are storming the zoos to kind of eat their dogs, uh, well, eat the animals, right? Right. So if they're eating, <laughs> if they're breaking into zoos to eat zoo animals, they're most certainly eating their own pets right. at that point, right? It's yes. a real Walking Dead episode out there. Uh, and so I think <laughs> I think that was, that's a good response as a meme, right? Yeah. Uh, but it kind of reminds me of um, like her retaliation towards this meme. You can say many people have been saying right now, uh, it's something worth of uh, ethics investigation, right? Because now she's putting in um, her power in place to kind of uh, threaten, right, a private citizen. You can say, right, right? someone who's not part of a Congress, someone who's someone who's outside of this whole mess, um, and and that's what she does. She says. Uh, <laughs> She says, I have noticed that Junior here has a habit of posting nonsense about me whenever the Mueller investigation hits up, heats up. Please keep it coming, Junior. It's definitely a very, very large brain idea to throw a member of a body that will have subpoena power in a month. Have fun. Ta-ta. Uh, <laughs> she's got so, the guns. She's got guns, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, it couldn't, yeah, it's, it's perfect. I think she's going to have the same problem with Trump that Trump can't get off Twitter sometimes. I mean, I like his Twitters. His Twitters. <laughs> um, yeah. Her Twitters, though, are all over the place. Her Twitters like, are, is like that uh, Candyland and like uh, Rick and Morty episode where like there are unicorns flying around everywhere. And it's like you just can't make sense of the place. <laughs> uh, and I think that's what's going on with her. She can't really make sense of what's going on around her. Like what is exactly uh, she gotten herself into. I, I don't think she ever thought she could ever get this far. I right. think she only got this far because yeah, she's Latina, uh, and apparently now she's uh, Jewish. Uh, you know, she's whatever. <laughs> Sephardic. Uh, so yeah, Sephardic. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I did my uh, timeline, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw some people came from Spain <laughs> here to Puerto Rico, and some Jews may have been involved in some. I mean, of those I think departures. between you and I, we have so. We do. No, look, I'm not going to say. Here. I'm not going to lie. I, I am part Jewish. I'm point uh, zero three percent. Same. Right? Uh, did my, those uh, lines. Yeah, 23 me. Yeah, <laughs> I found out that I am part of the master race, uh, the Jewish. And so I think that's, you know, things have been uh, better for me ever since. Um, I feel a lot smarter and a lot uh, better with money, you know. <laughs> Askenazi Jew, right? Highest of the IQ. Yeah. What's funny is my friend, uh, Herzon, was, was, when, I, when I did that test, he said, like, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I think she had to do that because um, she kind of trampled on a major uh, foreign policy issue there with the whole Israel-Palestine issue. That's right. So she had to say, hey, whoa, 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 guys, before you, uh, you know, things get out of control, I just want to say. Um, and I'm one of you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It, it, you know, it's weird how in 2018 we have political figures talking about these tiny percentages of whatever that they have of ancestry, you know, right. and you think well, that would have been the case maybe in, in Hitler's Germany where it was really important to be right. pure. <laughs> and now you, you're just touting whatever minor amount of whatever. I think you Hitler have. was also part Jewish, I think, right? <laughs> kind of weird. But with Elizabeth Warren, all right, all these people need to have like, uh, like I saw this video like hey I'm going to like meme university I'm getting a meme degree you know and that, that's hilarious <laughs> I'm thinking that actually might actually be necessary for some people like maybe in the public brand images of like marketing or something like that even for her it's like is this memeable what will people meme about this uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah. for Elizabeth Warren yeah. they need to put uh, for anybody some like like meme uh, specialist on the payroll to show how could this backfire? <laughs> how would I mean this if right. I were your opposition, right? right. I mean, as a, as a marketing specialist, you're supposed to look at like not your brand content you're putting out there, but your competitors and how you can like compete against that. Um, and if you're a politician, you're competing against other politicians and you're also competing against Facebook, 4chan, uh, right. uh, the meme world. And so you should kind of know how this could have backfired when you go out there and say like, oh, I'm like going one, like less than 1% on, on Native American. Yeah. Right? You sure you want to put that out there, boss? <laughs> right. I think uh, Nixon actually did that himself. No he, way. He was super paranoid, you know, obviously. And uh, so he, he came up with, he had like, one of the people I heard of this from was Pat Buchanan, who said, right. um, 
he had Pat Buchanan, who was like a paleocon, old school conservative, and then he had a, like a liberal Republican, even like um, and then a moderate, and so he had a he had a lot of large cross section of the Republicans, and back then I think they they covered more ground than maybe they do today. So right, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea if you're a political figure and you feel like you should test the waters before you put something out there. I mean, <clears throat> it's a different. Uh animal out there in terms of media than it was like bill clinton's time right, right. i don't remember memes back then right i remember pogs <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah <laughs> uh, i remember uh weird yahoo chat boxes um aol and uh you know mom get off the phone and trying to be on the internet and play age of empires with my friends or something right. like that right exactly um i think <laughs> <laughs> i mean it kind of reminds me of like george bush senior because i don't know much about him because i wasn't around back then so um but you know the people are in today because they're kind of around memes and you see like a lot of the attention driven towards them making fun of them uh in a more indirect way um i think memes are a good way to kind of laugh at the situation and kind of bring uh attention to these sort of things as well so so i think it's a new it's a new propaganda tool yeah it's a way to not take government seriously at all right and certainly i mean the way that they act is is seconds later being mocked and ridiculed, right? right. Which is great. <laughs> I mean, people are saying like, uh, "This is like an information age." You know, you know, your videos have to be like, you know, five minutes. Uh, not this one, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, the things they have to show. Like, people are like readily getting information like all over the place really fast. Like business decisions, all these sort of things. Uh, it's not like a, a normal nine to five weekend for most people. The things that go out there in the media and the news, especially in politics, it happens so fast. It's kind of like that. The attention is brought quicker that way. In fact, like, like that guy in um, in the Middle East, or I forgot what what happened. Like this ambassador got killed, and this guy made like a uh, a, a dancing um, Greece pose, going like this. Do, do you remember that? Mm. I don't know. Is so, it the? Um, is it in Turkish, Libya? I think it was like a Turkish ambassador or something like that. Got assassinated at an art gallery. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And someone came in going like this, right? Right. I right. think that was the first time I saw people <laughs> making fun of something serious that just has happened. Right. But the memes just started coming out of that and just posing in a different situation and in, in, in light of, you know, me people just did just die, but right. that information came out. Um, makes it easier kind of see the uh not just like the violence of it but you know the lightheartedness of like uh like this is just politics mm-hmm. um you get you get this not just from like obama to trump i know with her and i think like she's the best christmas gift that we're gonna right. receive <laughs> yeah it, well she she has been one of these people that is she she started out as this I- ideological idealist uh type figure right with with democratic socialists of america right and that was her original affiliation i guess she drew a lot of support from them yeah and then so you see that and you think okay but you're gonna have to sacrifice a lot of your supposed socialist beliefs in order to go to dc and in the process we're going to get to enjoy that uh that complete nullification of what you thought what you said your beliefs were this whole time Right. You know, as it relates to what she said about Palestine and Israel, and uh, all, all of a sudden she doesn't she doesn't believe that anymore. <laughs> oh man, I, I can't believe she actually went to like a Hanukkah event <laughs> and just came out there and just, just, just said that. Uh, I think she actually really knows like the effect of some of these things. Kind of like um, there's like some people like don't know if actually like what, what they say. Um, there's that meme that came out like like uh, Sarah Palin, like she's like uh, the Democrats, uh, Sarah Palin, in, in a way. <laughs> uh, you could say it's true, um, but like yeah, the way that uh, she mentions, like she has no idea like the, about the chambers of government she'll, she'll bring up uh, or how things are paid is like I think she's like really a good representative of like left wing people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like they don't know what's going on. Right. <laughs> they don't know how the economy works. They don't know how things are paid for. They don't know that uh, that this is, comes out from my wallet. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
or like if you ask like there's this guy mark dice that goes around asking people like oh you know like what do you think about you know what, what do you think we celebrate uh july 4th independence day like nobody knows right i think she does a good job of representing those people right um it's course, bad. It's yeah. bad for young people too, because she's held out as this. Well, she's the prototypical millennial, yeah, right? And yeah. Millennials are very supportive of socialism, so right. she speaks for them, and she has nothing intelligent to say. Nothing. So. Nothing. I haven't heard anything. Anything. Uh, I, have, I have a friend who backs her still on Facebook. Is like, oh, you know, just just wait. <laughs> Just wait till for the socialist revolution. Yeah, just so. wait till the social revolution, or just wait, just wait. You know, they're, they're thinking that like we're just kind of making fun of her because, like, you know, because uh, we have nothing else to do. It's like, no, this it's a good representation of like what I've seen out there as well, um, and maybe of my friend. I don't know. I'll think about that. Right. Um, but I would say, um, I think her and expertise. You could say, but you know, Obama had the same. And expertise. And you could say maybe even Trump has the same inexpertise in politics. Maybe that's a good thing. But in her case, uh, it's not that she lacks this. I think she kind of lacks a lot of like real world. She worked as a, as a waiter, waitress. Right. Right. So it's like, how do you not see like how her government kind of messes She's you? well educated, right? Yeah, you, I mean, you can say that, right? She went to Boston University, I guess. Right. And, uh, yeah. A degree in economics or something like that. Right. Yeah. So she knows how to run the economy. I, right. guess, that's what you're... <laughs> I guess that's it, right? <laughs> I guess if you want to bring back the days, you know, a lot of people say like Andrew Jackson is great because you know you just let anybody come in and take office, and that's kind of what you want in government. And you're like, oh, let's let people have their chance. Sure. It's like yeah, I guess you know, it kind of brings back to some Jacksonian uh, age. I guess that's good. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. It's 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 this. Um, I what I like about it is in in this day and age we have this ability to see that these people in in power are not any different from you and I. That's I mean, point, you see yeah. that all you got to do is watch that uh, clip of Trump going back and forth with Schumer and Pelosi in the Oval Office. They were right. supposed to have a little meeting, right? And instead, it turned into a shouting match, right? And you're like, and, this is what I came here to see. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and like, and like, they're like. Get this media cameras out of my face. <laughs> it just goes to show you that's, um, you know, like when you see things in the light of daylight, it's the best, you know, disinfectant, as they say. Right. right. And that's that's the best disinfectant for your for anyone thinking that the government is is uh, really this pristine institution. Then. All right. <laughs> I think my favorite quote of her recently was the uh, like in terms of like uh, they were talking about uh climate change and all this stuff. And she's like, well, we need to invent technology that's never been invented yet. <laughs> that's like one of those Captain Obvious kind of phrases. Like, oh, thanks, Captain Obvious. You know, yeah, of course. It's like Dan yeah. Quayle. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, she, you know, if she were a white male, she would be Dan Quayle. She would be Dan Quayle. <laughs> I think um, that would be the, Chris, the best uh, Christmas gift for us for the next year. And we'll see how she continues to spurs those memes again like i mentioned last podcast i just wish that it was just one meme and that'll be it you know a couple memes but like she continues to kind of open her horse mouth and kind right. of spews them out right. right good for her it's it's great news that people like this decide to run for office i mean um uh, you almost worry that she might try to educate herself a little right. bit and then the, the spigot will be turned off but yeah i doubt it <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, uh, well, actually, before I, we cut it off here, I wanted to go over one more thing, uh, hierarchies. So we had a user question, somebody oh. asking about hierarchies in the group. I think it's good to go over questions, maybe, over these podcasts. Uh, somebody was asking about hierarchies, um, about whether or not uh, they're good or not. I think, like, in the Liberal REA group, someone was mentioning, well, you know, they kind of go naturally have a tendency towards tyranny, right? Um, and so, like, you know, but, in, in what in what respect, right? In terms of the political sense, right? Uh, yeah, you, you can see that all the time, right? It's easy. Uh, in terms of like the capital sense, that's kind of hard. Unless there's government involved, you can piggyback on legislation that kind of keeps your company afloat longer than it should have been, and you can establish a monopoly. Right. Uh, now, I like Amazon, and I don't like Amazon. Like their adoption of the fifteen dollars per hour wage is an interesting move. Even though they were technically, I would say, already paying them fifteen dollars an hour wage because right. they would get Amazon shares, right? That could be valued even more than that, right? And even more the longer you worked, right? Right, right. Uh, because people don't have like a good sense of uh, um, 
uh, time time preference, right? right? They couldn't see that. Um, but that move could also signal legislation to go into place that forces everyone to pay 15 an hour, which they can, of course, and other businesses and smaller than them cannot, right? Uh, so I, I don't I don't know how I feel about Amazon in that regard because some some places have done that before. Um, you look at uh, the meat packaging industry, uh, for example, in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Right. He never visited. Well, he, he took the same tour that anyone was allowed to take, right? Very easily, casual. You know, yeah, going around, take a look. They were very open about this sort of stuff. He did not do the investigative work in detail that he that he makes it seem and appear in that book. Like, oh my God, you know, you see what Poured they're doing. Over, yeah. Yeah, it, that never happened. Never happened. Right. Yeah. But the meat industry back then were like, Let's say this did happen. <laughs> Let's raise the cost a barrier of entry for businesses to go in there because we can we can absorb this cost and our competitors could cannot, and that's what happened. Um, so I would say, uh, in that respect, for like companies like Amazon, where they're yeah. they're they they definitely are interested in creating uh, a difficult climate, and that's what government does really well at you know sort yeah. of a protectionism for intra-economy activity. Right. But with hierarchies... Right. So I saw this cool, like, Photoshop thing, or like a PowerPoint thing at Mises Institute University. Have you been there yet? I have not yet. All right, so it's apparently, you can, <laughs> apparently you could go twice. Uh, my friend Malioli has been like three, four times, and they had to change the role because he's been there many <laughs> times. Um, but they were talking about how Something I didn't really think about. Wait, they changed the rules? They can't do that. <laughs> yeah. They got to just accept right, as many right, people right. over and over. There as... is one rule I do have contention <laughs> with, and that's their uh, no gun policy. Oh, yeah. Oh, Interesting. Right. Intra libertarian yeah, weird, argument huh? to yeah. be had. Well, I mean, they're at an Auburn University campus area, so maybe that's what it is. Um, I know, but it's a private establishment. Don't ask, right? don't tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was my thing when I first came in. I was like, huh. All right. Yeah. But I was like, everything else is great. <laughs> if, if, yeah, I don't like it when gun stores do that, too. That's right? not, that's not okay. Um, I, as far as hierarchies, you know, one person who's actually influenced me on this issue is uh, Michael Malice, who is a podcaster. Um, he's a ghostwriter, and he does, he wrote this book called Dear Reader, and it's about his time spent in uh, North Korea. Um, so it's a play on words a little bit. Um, but... One of the things he talks about a lot is he, he'll talk about hierarchies and how you know it's not necessary to respect hierarchies or to pretend like the person at the top is always right or wrong, even in a free market scenario. But he so he goes into that a lot, even though he's uh, he's an anarchist and he doesn't he doesn't believe in government or anything like that. And so I think the best way to look at a lot of people look at hierarchies with uh, business, and what they see really is government enforced right. hierarchies. But if you look at a private business and you you talk to the president or the CEO or whatever, just always realize he usually might not know as much as you do, or he might know just as much as you do, and you could also start that business and do just as well as he could. Right. But it always demands a lot of respect. A lot of people are scared of uh, people who run businesses, and you know and uh, have a lot of wealth and power and, and say, I can never do that. Right. I would say those people in business sometimes should be scared because there's something called uh, uh, CEO takeovers, right? There are corporate sharks out there who make it their business uh, to take over a CEO, uh, either to liquidate everything or change things to be more profitable. But you can say like, even yeah. in terms of hierarchy, it's like you're a CEO, but that's not like always certain. Right. Yeah. Uh, so like, like there's like this Shark Tank episode. You've seen that. I, I really love that show. That's like a yeah. very ANCAP kind of good show out there, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's like a, an episode of or, or something to the effect of like someone talking about like you know what what could you do to make your business better, right? Like a like there's like a CEO takeover shark there. I like, well I I could do this this and this is that. And so like, why haven't you? Right. Right. And, yeah. And like. Oh, he's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. That's like a good opportunity uh, for a corporate shark to come in and just take over, right? So these people at, at these hierarchies is always fluctuating, you can say. Like Blockbuster used to be at top, but they couldn't compete in a market. And, and so like nobody really liked their kind of late rental fees. Uh, 
uh, and Netflix had an ingenious way to take over from that. Right. Um, so most people don't really stay at the top for so long um, in terms of the market, and are people like middle class and and the upper class in terms of that respect it kind of fluctuate back and forth. But uh, the market does a good job in checking hierarchies. You know, if it's a bad decision that the uh, corporate board is making, they'll go bankrupt, right? Or someone else will come and take over. Right. Yeah, uh, there, it's just a moment in time. You know, it's very temporary. And for someone to claim that they have the the corner on, you know, they've got the whole market cornered on on what's the best practice to use in this industry or whatever. It's, yeah. It's, it's not only going to last a little while. I mean, someday we'll be talking about Amazon. And, oh, wasn't that neat? They sold a bunch of different products online and then uh, somebody came in and destroyed them, you know, right. and cut and cut costs or, or whatever. And uh, nobody complains about that. You you notice right. like yeah. nobody compl- nobody sheds a tear for the uh, great business uh, the blockbusters of the right. world. So um, you know what, and that's just as it should be. I mean, they that's and there was a lot of small businesses, small video stores that blockbuster. Uh, destroyed too, I'm sure. Right. So it it just goes both ways. <laughs> Yahoo at one point was like the number one search engine for a while, for for a long time. Right. It's no longer. <laughs> right. Yeah. MySpace versus Facebook. Uh, you really can't predict these sort of things, but you know that there's a history of these things of changing hierarchies of who's better in terms of like hiring the right people to kind of propel um, profit different organization. That's that's how you're rewarded. Right. You're rewarded with profit. Right. Right. Although I should report it with um, unemployment. <laughs> right. It's always a, a minute away. I mean, there, a lot of these companies are just on the cusp of of collapsing. You know, if a few things turn turn against them. Right. So it's a miracle that I'm almost impressed that any business does well. Right. Because it's so hard <laughs> to even turn a profit or pay your bills to right. net zero. Right. Is uh, impressive. <laughs> so I think that's. Uh... A good wrap up, good covers of that question too. Um, yeah, that's a good question then. Yeah, for sure. I think we'll do that for now. We'll yep. just cover user questions. Uh, so yeah, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Yep. Thanks for coming on to the show uh, as my co-host. And uh, yep, tell me next time a little bit more about Kennedy Financials. Yes. Yes. We'll do. <laughs> <laughs> and whether you guys are related as a bastard or a son <laughs> of Jay. I, I hope so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And with that, stay liberated. Deal. Take good care.